What's up, the generation? Welcome to the Big Bets on Campus podcast presented by BetMGM. This is the Sweet 16 college basketball betting preview. I'm stuck in joining me for today's episode are Mike and Mike, Mike Calabrese and Mike Randall. Today, we will go through all eight Sweet 16 games, four on Thursday night, four on Friday night, and we have some juicy matchups. It was a chalky first weekend. Best start for favorites since 2008. Double-digit favorites, 15-2 and two against the spread if you got the best number. Best ever start the tournament. Top four seeds, 22-8 and eight against the spread. Also the best ever. It's the third tournament where chalk went 15-1 and one or better in round two, joining 2009 and 2019. For what it's worth, two one seeds made the final four in 2009, but only one. Made it in 2019. That was Virginia, which ended up winning the national title. And for what it's worth, the Sweet 16 has been the best round for underdogs over the past five tournaments. So maybe we get some barking dogs. We're going to break every game down in chronological order. And, well, you know, the lack of upsets was a little bit disappointing. What that means is you get the best possible matchups in the Sweet 16, an Elite Eight, Final Four, and ultimately national title. So uh, before we jump in, Randall, I'll throw it to you. How are you feeling ahead of the Sweet 16? I feel good. My Clemson Tigers keep rolling, and I don't think we're done yet. We had a couple upsets early. Everybody wants the upsets early, want the Blue Bloods late. And that's what I think we're headed towards. We could have some epic Elite Eight matchups. Only one stuck I'm mad about when you get in the Sweet 16, of course, was Auburn-UConn, which would have been great. But Bruce Pearl doesn't know how to scheme to stop James Pilikitis, I guess, which is fine until unless Jake, uh, Chad baker Mazzaro went out and that threw his game plan off. But other than that, we have some really good matchups. Could have UConn-Iowa State, Purdue-Tennessee, could have Houston-Marquette. So could be a great, great weekend. Yeah, I mentioned 2019. Favorites actually went 16 and 0 straight up in the second round. And in 2019, we had one of the best Elite Eights ever. Two games went to overtime. Michigan State beat Duke by one. I think the only Elite Eight that was better for my money was 2005, in which I think three of the four games went to overtime. Just an epic tournament. 2005, one of my favorite tournaments ever. Uh, as far as drama is concerned, Calabrese, how are you feeling ahead of the Sweet 16? I'm feeling great. The 2005 callback, I think that was the days when they used to have like the unique courts as opposed to like everything's all sanitized. It all says March Madness in the middle of the court. Um, that was the Arizona Illinois comeback, correct? Yep. I, uh, that, that's the one thing I didn't like about that tournament. Um, I had a future on uh arizona who blew a 15 point lead and they ended up losing it was just an epic meltdown great game they lost in overtime 90 to 89 and i love that team salim stoudemire who had an off shooting night that game was just so fun to watch um in that year i think it was 2000 yeah 2005 2004 2005 salim stoudemire shot over 50% from three on six and a half attempts per game. Uh, 91% from the line, 50.4% from three, and over 50% from the field. Uh, and then, but he had an off shooting night. I also, this was back when, you know, this was college, uh, college days for me. Um, I used to fill fill out a bunch of well, the 10 allowed on ESPN. I was number one overall um, headed into that game. And I was like doing the math on all the, all the brackets that were in the hundredth percentile with me. And I'm pretty sure I would have won it if, uh, if Arizona won at all. So that was a deflating moment, but awesome game. Go on YouTube and watch that. If you uh, are not as old as us, uh, crazy, crazy game. Um, but that was just an awesome tournament. Yeah. As a callback to that, I was at Mizzou as a freshman 
and EA Sports used to bring like a traveling tour. You could play in tournaments for their video games and they had their March Madness video game. And I made it into like the Elite Eight on campus. And I played with Arizona that year. That was like my team. And this kid sits down next to me and we're just making small talk before the game starts. And I was like, I just love this point guard, Mustafa Shakur. It's like such a ridiculous name. And I was like, I'm Mike, by the way. What's your name? He's like, Mustafa. I was like, no, that, that's really funny. His name was Mustafa. So he ended, he got in my head before I even tip off of that one. Uh, ended up getting booted in the Elite Eight myself. So I got to join the real life Wildcats. Um, but yeah, I agree. That game is absolutely bananas. I think they played in Chicago on DePaul's court for that one. Um, one of the best March Madness games of all time. Uh, Mustafa Shakur. Uh, uh, I'm sure DeBundo knows this, but Montgomery County guy. Winwood Pet PA. Uh outside of Philly kid. Um, all right. Anyway, enough about uh we're we're losing all of our listeners who are under the <laughs> age of uh 30. All right, let's uh let's get to the games. We'll start on Thursday. Let's go chronologically through all eight. Let's start with the first tip off between Clemson and Arizona, which will tip off 709 in Los Angeles, Arizona currently a seven and a half point favorite. Totals ticked up a bit to one fifty two. Uh, a couple things that I'll mention here: ACC twenty nine and eleven against the spread over the past three tournaments. Eight no straight up and seven one against the spread this year in the main bracket. The ACC just continues to exceed expectations with the teams that they get in the dance and. I will say this Clemson team, and for people that have been following all year, our podcast portfolio, we have three futures left. Clemson Final Four, Tennessee, and Houston. So we have some stuff to root for. Um, Headed into the Sweet 16, which is really all you can ask for and adds to the excitement. But this Clemson team, people tend to forget that that they – out of conference earlier this season, they were extremely successful. I think they went five and zero against tournament teams, beat UAB on a neutral, Boise State at home, won at Alabama, beat South Carolina at home, and TCU on a neutral. They had a really strong non-conference schedule. Stumbled some through the ACC schedule, but have seemed to be peaking at the right time. I think there's a bit of value in the Tigers here. They can you know, they could take away a couple of Arizona's primary avenues to offense. What are those? Clemson very good in transition defense. They're very good in limiting second chance opportunities, good on the defensive glass, top 10 in the nation in points per possession allowed on second chance opportunities, and they're great at defending at the rim. Where they're at a disadvantage here is – athletically with their guards on the perimeter. But that was the case in the first two matchups as well. So what has to happen here, again, they're going to play a very compact defense. You might even see some zone. Arizona didn't fare too well in games they saw zone in league play. I think they went three and five in games that they saw zone on uh, at least 10 possessions in league play. So Clubs are going to slow it down, pack it in which will help defend Bala, who does have an advantage in the post. And then you got to hope Arizona, you know, doesn't shoot the lights out from three. Clemson did benefit from some shooting luck in the first two rounds. No one could take advantage, but that's their best course of action on the defensive end. And Caleb Luck could certainly shoot Arizona out of the game. And the other end, Clemson works through the post, one of the most post-heavy offenses in the country. Arizona, 34th percentile in post-defense per synergy. They haven't been great in that department, but Clemson's not really a rim-attacking offense, and that's okay against Arizona. It gives up a ton of mid-range jumpers. They will give up open three looks. Clemson does have the shooters here, so I think they can slow this game down. They can work through Paul, who can kind of move, follow around, take him out to the perimeter. He really struggles to defend in space. And as long as love and that Arizona perimeter isn't going nuclear, I think Clemson has a shot here. Randall, what say you? Clemson's going to win. I think Clemson's winning the game. I, 
this Arizona team is based around Caleb Love, which is a very dangerous thing. And what I mean by based around, 205 more field goal attempts for a 41% shooter from the field for Caleb Love. They don't really attack a lot off the dribble. Pell Larson really doesn't as well. The concern is Hall foul trouble because then Balo can yeah, really go nuts big. inside. But they have shot well. The offensive sets have been fantastic. Gerard doing these flare screens away on the weak side of the ball. Chase Hunter has been fantastic. He was great in the last game as well. Has even improved on defense. They don't turn the ball over stuck. They make their free throws. They should limit Arizona in transitions. I've liked Clemson. I thought the winner of New Mexico, Clemson, was going to go far. And here we are. And remember, like you said, on the other side of this bracket, Alabama, North Carolina, both teams, Clemson beat on the road. I think the only reason people aren't getting behind Clemson is because of the name, because Brad Brumell doesn't inspire a lot of momentum and confidence, but they have a big inside. Their guards are playing well. They can shoot the three. They can limit in transition. They make their free throws. They don't turn it over enough. Give me normal variants from three with Arizona and give me PJ Hall not getting one of those silly anger fouls like when he ran into the player uh, the, the other day against Baylor when he got frustrated and get a post feed. And I think Clemson wins the game. So I'll take Clemson in seven and a half. Yeah, I mentioned their ability to limit second chance opportunities and defend at the rim. Arizona's top 10 in both. So that's critical. And uh, I mentioned Arizona two and five in league play when they saw zone in at least 20 possessions. So you could see some zone here. They're 40th percentile in zone offense compared to 90th first man. They got swept by Washington State. They used a lot of zone, worked through the post, you know, slowed the game up at times, limited transition up. Like there's a lot of similarities and parallels to what Clemson can do here. You did mention the Hall foul trouble. He's been in foul trouble a lot this season and in the tournament. Clemson has overcome it. But, yeah, him staying out of foul trouble because he can move Balo around. He's so good on the offensive end. That will be key. Although they do have more depth down low since Jack Clark returned from injury. He's been big. Um, gives them some added versatility on the defensive end. So, yeah, I think Clemson is definitely live here. Calabrese, would you agree? Yeah, I'm going to sprinkle on the money line here. I'm not going to bypass the points. I think, you know, close to plus 260. I think it's too generous. And you guys did a great job of laying out why. When you look at Arizona's last three losses on this season against Oregon, against USC, against Wazoo, they made 16 threes in total in those three three losses. Really, they're just... Zones. Little... Saw zones in all three. Exactly. And you talk about the similarity with Washington State. I also look at, on the other end, what if Arizona you know, gets up and down and makes this a, a higher tempo game? Well, Clemson throughout the season, they beat Alabama and Tuscaloosa. They beat North Carolina on their home floor by four. So it's not as though if they get pulled out of their preferred tempo that it's game over, which is some of the cases with underdogs in this tournament. Um, so, yeah, I, I think this is all trending towards there being too much value on Clemson. And then additionally, the last piece of it, I mentioned it on the show with Waddell, like PJ Hall hasn't even played his best yet. He's got 25 points in this whole tournament. I think if he can stay on the floor, stay out of foul trouble, I think this is going to be, you know, a very close game in the second half. And an Arizona team that all of a sudden, you know, from last year losing to Princeton and people are kind of wondering, are they going to be snake bit again? Ooh, they beat Long Beach. Ooh, they beat Dayton, who really did it to themselves. You had those foul shots that, um, you know, Holmes missed. That could have been a one possession game down the stretch. So I think they're getting too much love in the market for what really were two easy games, you know, through the tournament thus far. So, yeah, I'm with you guys on Clemson. Yeah, Dayton couldn't hit a three even though they're one of the best three-point shooting teams in the country. There was a, sw a five-minute stretch where they missed two front ends. Arizona got a three off one of them in transition. And Arizona missed a front end, got the offensive rebound kicked out for three. I mean, you're talking – That's the game. Yeah, that's the game seven, right there. eight-point yeah. swing in two minutes. And Dayton couldn't make a three. So, I mean, Arizona easily could have lost that game. And don't forget, this is an Arizona team that – it's not like they've been pristine – away from the McHale Center all year. They are, per Haslam metrics, I think that they're, now this some of this speaks to how good they are at home, but they're 348th and away from home. Remember, seven of their eight losses have come away from home. And they lost to three non-tournament teams on the road in Oregon State, USC, and Stanford. So uh, I think Clemson has a shot here. Just have to hope Love doesn't go nuclear. Um, that would, uh, or Hall gets in foul trouble, both those things could obviously throw a wrench into this. Officials will play a major part in a lot of these games. Can Hall stay out of foul trouble? Purdue 
Gonzaga, we'll talk about that game. All these physical defenses, Tennessee, Houston, Iowa State, how will they be allowed to defend? Officials are going to play a major role. A lot of these games, Mark, it's super efficient this time. They're going to come down to matchups, three-point variants, as always in college basketball games, random endgame scenarios and luck, and the whistle, uh, which is why I love this time of year, Mark, it's pretty efficient. Um, you, know, you have new new venues, too, so keep that in mind. But I, I really like and prefer to bet live. And we'll talk about some of those spots throughout the episode. But let's move on to our second game, which will tip about a half hour after the first between San Diego State and UConn and Boston, Massachusetts. San Diego State, 11-point underdog here. Total, 136. This will mark only the third national title rematch in the NCAA tournament since expansion in 1985. The first, 1992, between UNLV and Duke. And the second, 2007, between Florida and UCLA. Both those happened in the final four. UConn has been a wagon in the tournament, not just this year, not just last year, where they are 8-0 against the spread. But in their past 30 tourney games, they're 24-6 and against the spread, covering by over a touchdown per game. Just stunning numbers. They do have a travel advantage here. San Diego State coming across the country and will have a partisan crowd in Boston. I'm going to go a little contrarian to make a case for San Diego State, but I think you guys are going to like UConn. So I'll let you get the first crack, Calabrese. Well, you mentioned the travel disparity. Uh, I did a little research. It's the largest travel disparity uh, with UConn only traveling 85 miles in the history of the Sweet 16. So San Diego State's got to go over 3,000 miles to get to this game after going 2,600 miles round trip to Spokane for their you know first and second round matchups. Um, yeah, I, I can't get like... I can't talk myself into the Aztecs in any significant way in this game. And UConn, even though I think the numbers priced just about right, I think the first half is the way to go about this. So I already have a bet in on the Huskies minus six. They failed to cover a first half, half number in their three games in the Big East tournament, but they flipped a switch. As you mentioned it, Hurley has got them motivated. He's got them basically feeling like they have a chip on their shoulder. The committee's not doing him any favors. All these you know, things that he's saying, whether we believe it or not, doesn't matter at all. It just depends how this translates on the floor for the Huskies. And they played with their hair on fire, just blitzing stats and blitzing Northwestern. I think it's going to be similar in this spot. And that actually ties in with a season long trend. They were second nationally in first half scoring margin at plus 10 per game. And they were far and away the best team in the first 20 minutes when playing away from home this season in that same stat. So I'll go ahead with the Huskies and lay the six, you know, this number, in terms of just the first half, open at five, five and a half. I think there's a couple five and a half still out there in the market. I would gobble those up. See, I don't show a ton of value in many of these games. We know who these teams are, but I actually do show some value, enough to bet on San Diego State. Although I will admit, it's hard to price UConn because they've been so dominant, yet they also dealt with injuries during the season. Like they weren't at full strength for stretches, um, which is definitely worth noting. But I do think that they're at the very peak of their market value. I mean, everyone's just talking about they're just free money. They're eight no against the spread in the tournament over the past two seasons. But keep in mind, last year they beat what three fives, a four, a thirteen, uh, and an eight. And this year they beat, you know, a, a sixteen and an short-handed uh, eight seed. So it's not like they faced elite competition. One of those teams was San Diego State. I will mention in that national title last year. I think San Diego State's a tad bit better. They're close than last year's team. The spread was seven and a half. The total also was like 131. Now, national title totals are going to be a little lower. But, and and UConn ended up covering that game. Now, granted, San Diego State couldn't make a shot in that game. But you have to keep in mind that UConn plays, San Jose shot six of 23 from three in that game, 26%. UConn plays a lot slower this year. They last year they were 200th in adjusted tempo. This year they're 315. And you get a higher total and a, a spread that's four points higher. So why do I like San Diego State here? Well, I think that there's just a tad bit of value in the number. You also have Brian Dutch, a really good game plan head coach with time to prepare. He's had a lot of success in that department. Last year, the national title don't really benefit from that. And you know, you're going up against an offense that has a lot of the you know, new faces, but some of the same similarities. But I go back to St. John's. St. John's went 0-3 against UConn, but they hung around in all three games. 
And I have San Diego State and St. John's power rated almost similarly. And they kind of profile the same in a lot of ways. So what do you, and do things that you have to do well against UConn. What do you have to do? You have to operate efficiently in the mid-range. Like that's what you have to do against their drop. UConn allows mid-range attempts to the top 20 clip. St. John's, ninth in mid-range field goal percentage. San Diego State, 55th. You have to get second chance points. UConn, 138th in second chance points per possession allowed. You have to force turnovers with the ball pressure. UConn, if there's one kind of wart, it's their press numbers. Their 38th percentile against the press per synergy. You know, St. John's going to press more than San Diego State, but they're both two of the most press-heavy teams in the country. You have to defend at a high level at the rim because UConn ranks third in the country near proximity percentage. San, both St. John's and San Diego State do all of those things. San Diego State's actually even better with points per possession off of steals. And they're both very good in second chance opportunities. They're both elite defending at the rim. And they both have a lot of guys who can kind of thrive in the mid-range. Now, it's not going to be easy, especially in Boston against this awesome UConn team. And you're, you work through Ladie. He's going to have to move Klingon around. He can't try to just attack him in the post. It's just not going to work. He's going to have to hit some mid-range jumpers. He's going to maybe have to hit a couple threes. He did against Yale. He's three for three from deep in the tournament. But they're just going to have to slow this game down to a crawl, which they can do. They also have really good positional length and switchability on defense, which you need against UConn's elite motion. So I think that they can just ugly this game up enough, cause enough turnovers, make enough mid-range shots. If they're making threes, that's even a bonus. Now, if UConn's making their threes, it's over. Uh, but San Diego State's going to contest. They're very good in that department. Um, maybe Ladie can get clinging in foul trouble. That would be massive. But I just think this spread's a little too high. There are some advantages here for San Diego State. UConn is a wagon. I don't like betting against them. Really only did it this year with uh, St. John's for a lot of the same reasons I like San Diego State here. Randall, I'll let you break the tie. 60 to 55 in the national championship game with five minutes left. San Diego State's making a move. And then Jordan Hawkins comes off a staggered screen away from like the logo and drills it. It was game over. But they fought in that huge game. Shot. They, it was a huge shot for the spread and for the title. San Diego State has exactly what you need to keep this game close. Ladie inside, most improved player I've seen this year. He's become a monster inside. And San Diego State can guard the perimeter and guard the three well enough to keep this game close. They are allowing opponents 30.8% from beyond the arc. Now, I know that they struggle to score, but this is a matchup where the Aztecs are very familiar with UConn. Yes, they're traveling. I don't care about that. They want revenge. They'll be motivated. Dutcher is a great coach. James Pulakitas under for Yale was the easiest bet of the round of 32 because there was no way that Dutcher was going to let that happen. He will come up with something. All we need here for a San Diego State cover is UConn not to go ballistic from three-point range. Give me San Diego State. It was 50% from three-point range against Yale just to do enough to hang around I am with you, Stuck. I like San Diego State. No one is on them in this matchup. No one whatsoever. And when you have an eight-point spread, I believe the under about the last 30 games is something like 24-6-2 and two in the Sweet 16. So lower scoring game. Both teams, UConn doesn't play at a fast pace. Familiarity, the unique ability to guard the perimeter and to hang inside with Klingon. I'll take the Aztecs. Yeah, just got to make enough mid-range shots. Cause a few turnovers, get some easy buckets. Maybe get clinging in foul trouble. It's not out of the the I mean, everyone's acting like San Diego State can't win this game. Um, there's a path if they ugly this up enough that they can. Um, now UConn is gonna win this game more times than not. They're the best team in the country, but there are some potential paths here for the Aztecs. So hopefully the wagon of UConn isn't too wagony for us, Randall. Uh all right especially in the second half. Maybe you can cover the first half for Cal Reese and us for the game. All right, let's move on to the late slate on Thursday night. We'll start with Alabama, North Carolina. 9.39 tip 
North Carolina is a four and a half point favorite. Total 173 and a half. This game will be played in Los Angeles. Hubert Davis, 8-0 against the spread in the tournament. Third coach in NCAA tournament history to do so, joining Gary Williams and Andy Enfield. This is also the highest at the close year, the highest tournament total since 1995. We have not seen a total over 170 since 1995 until this year. And it's happened in all three Alabama tournament games. So you need to know about Alabama. They have a great offense. They play fast, as does UNC. And they don't play much defense. I, you know, no one is giving Alabama a chance in this game. Uh, similar to Connecticut versus San Diego State. But I will say, Alabama could beat anybody on any given night because of the three-point shooting. I think that's pretty much their only path here. They're like, so UNC, the problem for Alabama in this matchup is you have two teams that are, you know, very good on the offensive glass. The problem is Alabama is not good in the defensive glass. 245th, UNC's sixth. They get to the line, top 100 rates. UNC 69th in foul rate on defense. Alabama 327th. So all those extra points, offensive rebounds, free throws, UNC is going to get. Alabama also can't defend in the mid-range. That's a nightmare against R.J. Davis. They can't defend at the rim. That's a nightmare against Armin, Armando Bacon. So, and then you look, UNC elite at defending at the rim, and they're elite in transition. I've been so impressed with their transition defense all year. And Alabama, 84th percentile on transition frequency. So UNC can limit them in transition. They can limit them to the rim and all Alabama wants to do is you know either run and then it's a rim and three offense get to the rim or shoot threes they're going to be limited in second chance opportunities getting to the line at the rim so what are they going to have to do here they're going to have to hit threes and the odd thing is UNC allows you got to beat them in the mid-range they 346 in mid-range attempt rate allow but Alabama is 361st in mid-range attempt rate on offense they never want to shoot mid-range which is interesting but they're just going to have to hit a bunch of threes. They could, and I think Reitzel's going to play. They need him. He's their best perimeter defender. He shoots 45% from three on almost 150 attempts. Um, and, and UNC does give up a lot of threes. They've been lucky in that department. Give up like a pretty high percentage of unguarded threes. Well, they do a good job in limiting catch and shoot opportunities. But Alabama's 11 losses this year, they shot 28% from three. And they're averaging about 30 attempts. In their 23 wins, they shot 40.8%. So given the fact that UNC is probably going to take take away you know, their efficiency at the rim, limit them in transition, and UNC is going to be able to score at will, what, what does Alabama have to do? Number one, they have to hope UNC does not have a great night shooting from three because then there's no way they can keep up. But Alabama is... Probably because they're not going to get anything at the rim, they're not going to get in transition. They might shoot 35 to 40 threes in this game. Let's say it's 35. If they make only 10 and they shoot 28.6%, good night. See ya. Not a chance. If they hit 15, maybe shoot 43%. Um, they have a chance to be in it, assuming UNC isn't matching them for three, which very well could happen. That's what they have to do. Now, if they go like 18 of 35, that's their bet. Um, you're asking a lot. And that's they could beat anyone doing that. Um, but I think that's really the only path because it's hard for me to see. It's hard for me to envision Alabama getting many stops. I will be curious to see how Nate Oates plays Grant Nelson. Does he just say, F it, we're going with our best offensive lineup and hope Nelson is making threes? And who cares? We're not going to stop them at the rim anyway. Or does he go with his little better defenders uh, down low? That's something for me to watch. Uh, Randall, I'll throw it to you first. What are you seeing here in UNC Alabama? Yeah, UNC is vulnerable. And I don't care about that stat with Hubert because, of course, he missed the tournament in between that. But the rebounding advantage, the defensive advantage, R.J. Davis is the best player on the floor. I can't see it. I, they're vulnerable. This is not the game that it's going to happen. And Stuck, you know I hate these teams that rely heavily on three, like Creighton, et cetera. 
But it's really that simple. If Alabama comes out and is scorching the nets, they, they can absolutely win this game. Um, I'm not going to bet on it. I'll take North Carolina, lay the points. I get it. And I've been waiting to fade North Carolina. I don't think this is the matchup. I don't think they guard well enough. I think North Carolina can score. And I think there's a huge discrepancy on the board's offensive and defensive glass. So I'll take North Carolina. They're vulnerable. I just don't think Alabama is the team to get there because every time Alabama has played away from home, I know this is neutral site. When they played away from home, they have not fared well. At Tennessee, at Kentucky, at Auburn, at Florida, average loss, 19 and a half points per game. Yeah, there's definitely some correlation with their shooting and venue as well. Shot much better at home, which has a high correlation with those wins and losses. Calabrese, what are you seeing here? I mean, you said one line that I'm going to gravitate towards. North Carolina is going to score at will. So let's go over 89 and a half for the team total on UNC. I think there's different narratives and different hypotheticals in which you kind of laid out where Bama gets hot from three early. And for that reason, they can hang around for 40 minutes. But either way, they're going to play their brand of basketball. Nate Oates, you know, is stubborn in that way. So I feel like I'm going to take advantage of that, you know, data point. He's not going to try to slow down the game and muck it up and turn it into a half court game. So for that reason, just more opportunities for North Carolina. I think they can get past 89 and a half, even if they don't go nuts from three. If they do, I think they'll score in the triple digits in this game. So I think this number is about five points off. I probably play it all the way up to 94 and a half going over that. So the fact that it's in the high 80s, give it to me. All right, good stuff. Should be an entertaining up and down game. But let's move on to the last game on Thursday night, 10.09 Eastern in Boston, Massachusetts. Illinois will take on Iowa State in a 2-3 matchup. Illinois is a one and a half point underdog here. Total sitting around 146 and a half. Uh, This is my favorite matchup of the first round. Elite offense versus elite defense. Even on Kempom right now, number one offensive adjusted efficiency. Right now, Illinois, number one overall adjusted defense defensive efficiency is Iowa State. What gives? Lead offense versus lead defense. I've heard a lot of great cases for both sides. Uh, I could see both playing out. I uh well, I'll I'll hold my uh my take on this game until we hear from you. Uh Randall, I'll go to you first. What are you seeing in Iowa State, Illinois? It is very difficult for me in the Sweet 16 to take a team that does not play defense at a level at a championship level. And Illinois is fantastic. Moorhead State had a path against Illinois. I think they got I think Spradlin got rattled because Shannon was just going ballistic and had a great game. Guys, they were down one at the half. I want to change the thing. I think the move is to say we're going to limit everyone else and let Shannon do what he does. He's going to do his booty ball. Him and Domasco are going to back down. Iowa State will funnel that to the baseline. They'll trap it, and they'll have to make make them reverse. Iowa State would have to have a terrible shooting game, and Illinois would have to be able to score against really one or two, depending on how you want to look at Houston, best defensive teams in the country. I'm with TJ Osselberger. I'm with their defense. I know why the line is short here. Underwood's done a brilliant job. I think Iowa State will make enough shots. I know Shannon's going to go crazy. He can keep betting his overs. I have no problem with that. But I think if Osselberger's smart, he's going to limit everyone else and let Shannon do what he does. Because that worked for Moorhead State until they said, we have to stop Shannon. And then everyone else went crazy. And Domesk almost had, I think he had a triple-double. That is the key. I think the defense with Iowa State, they beat Houston twice. They've shown up in these games. And at some point, Illinois is going to have to play defense. And they've even struggled against Maryland. Teams that are physical with them on defense, they struggle with throwing the neutral site. It's not at home. I will take the Cyclones. I agree it's close. Great entertaining game. I'll take the Cyclones. Yeah, I think this is a coin flip game. I'm leaning towards Illinois right now. Just I trust their offense a bit more. But look, they're a rim attacking offense. You can't get anything at the rim against Iowa State, number one in near proximity percentage, excuse me, near proximity attempt rate allowed. They're going to have to hit their jumpers. They can play five out. They can move the ball. You know, Domask is an excellent passer. He can find open shooters. Shannon's going to have opportunities in isolation. Illinois is an elite offense in the final four seconds of the shot clock. That's where Iowa State makes you work. I, and Illinois, look, Iowa State's excellent across the board on defense, but you have to get offensive rebounds. You got to move the ball and hit threes. And I do think that while their transition D is also excellent, you got to get 
some points in transition before their D gets set, which I think Shen can do. Um, and and don't forget about you know the wild card here is Dane Danger. He's kind of changed the trajectory of Illinois' season. They're nine and one over their past ten games with him, and he's averaged fifteen minutes per game. He gives them more of a phys- in the in those ten games. He gives them more physical presence, better defense at the rim, better rebounding. He's their best defender per Evan Mia. The fourteen games prior, he only averaged six minutes. They went nine and five. So he's he brings some like versatility, gives Underwood some flexibility in how he wants to play this. So I'll be interested to see how many minutes he gets because I don't think, you know, he's if he has to come in for defense in the post, then it's going to hurt their offense. So I think their biggest advantage in their offense is they could play five out, move the ball, swing it, passes, get set up Shannon isolation. They have shooters all over to take advantage of Iowa State's aggressive defense. The other thing here is, you know, Illinois plays drop defense, force you to operate in the mid-range. They take away the three. And Iowa State's been hot from three. They're shooting 46.8% from three over the past four games in front of partisan crowds, which they won't really have here in Boston. So maybe they cool off, but Illinois does a great job taking away the three. They force you to operate in the mid-range. Iowa State, while they've been hot from three, not really a three-point line team, they're very comfortable in the mid-range, which does worry me a bit. But I think the key ultimately to this game is, you know, I think it'll be super close too. I'm I'm just going to trust the best player on the court in Shannon, I think, at the end of the day. But it's Ken. Illinois doesn't turn the ball over, statistically. They don't play with a point guard. They don't play with a true point guard. They run a lot of their offense through Damask, and it's kind of like a positionless team. So if you look, and Iowa State is one of the best teams in the country in forcing turnovers. So you would say, okay, Illinois can handle that. But this is a different level of pressure, right? They don't see this in the Big Ten. So can Illinois take care of the ball? That's the, that's the whole game to me. Because if, Illinois, if Iowa State is forcing turnovers, then they're going to get in transition. Illinois' transition is horrendous. They're going to get too many easy buckets in that sense. And that means Illinois is struggling to get into their offense. So that's huge for me. It's like, can Illinois' numbers are good in the turnover one, where they don't really see pressure like this. They don't really have a true point guard. That's huge for me, as is how much and when danger plays and his dynamic, which changes Illinois on both ends of the floor. Cal Brees, let me throw it to you. What are you seeing when you break the tie? So I'm going to be up there for these two games in Boston. I'm, I'm really excited for this one in particular. As you mentioned, the top Ken Palm rated offense in the last 10 games in the entire country is Illinois. You look at the differential in the t- terms of the Sweet 16 in the last 10 games, the bottom team left is Iowa State. So to me, it, it really does depend on how do they handle the on-ball pressure, pressure. Can they keep it to single-digit turnovers as they have in their tournament wins thus far the, on the Fighting Illini side? And if they do that and the Cyclones have to continually knock down shots, Illinois is also due for a bit of you know teams cooling off from three. Opponents have shot 38% from long range against them in the last two months. Iowa State, I yeah. still I still view them as a team that potentially could give up some second chance points. You look at their defensive rebounding percentage numbers, not great. 317th since February 1st. So yes, they defend the rim on the initial attack very, very well, but you can still get some easy buckets off of those offensive boards. Yeah, that's their I think, aggression. They're they're out of position because they're so aggressive and swarming that you can Yeah, exactly. Some, and I, I think certainly yeah. offensive rebound. And then finally, I mean, I, I want to respect this Iowa State team. I know I've poked some fun at Lipsy over you know the course of the year, but the fact is they faced five top 30 offenses this season in Baylor, BYU, Houston, Texas Tech, and Texas all in the Big 12. They went seven and two straight up and six and three against the spread. So I think this number is just about right. Um, but I am on the Illinois money line here. I don't want to you know, sitting, sitting there in the seat at halftime with Shannon having 15 or 20 points already, I'm going to be kicking myself. I think he's the kind of player that is capable of putting his team on his back. He's done it not just during this run, but he's done it in general throughout this season and throughout the course of his career. He's been a little streakier. I think he's finally playing consistent high-level basketball to the point where I want to hitch my wagon to him. So I'm going to take him both money line and then minus three because he can get the juice up to like plus 160. I think there's, there's good value in a bet like that. All right, let's move on to Friday. We'll start with the only double-digit seed remaining, NC State. The uh, I guess the Cinderella left uh, out of the ACC. They're catching six and a half against Marquette, the two seed. Schemel tip seven oh nine Eastern on CBS in Dallas, Texas. 
I, you know, when I look at this game, I mean, NC State, I don't know how they're still standing. Uh, they've tweaked their lineup and they've went on a run here. They won the ACC tournament, but look, they they beat Virginia in overtime to keep their season alive after a miracle bank. They beat Oakland in overtime and teams can't hit a three against them. They're, over their past six games, which they've won all six, credit to them, opponents have shot just 28.8% from three. Prior to the, that six game stretch, opponents were shooting 35.8% from three. That was 300th nationally. They cannot let Marquette go bananas from three here. So that, if that regression hits, it's lights out because I just do not see how NC State is getting stops. The way I see this game playing out, Number one, they have a bad pick and roll defense. Good luck against, you know, one of the best pick and roll offenses in the country, spearheaded by Tyler Kolick. They're going to move Burns around. They're going to take advantage of him in space, and they're going to score well. They're also going to score in transition. NC State's bad in that department, and like Marquette's very vulnerable in the glass on both ends. It's very weak, but NC State isn't a really elite rebounding team on either end. So I think off NC State's misses, Marquette's going to push it up the court. They're going to get easy buckets in transition. They're also going to get easy buckets in the half court. Now, where NC State can stay in this game, they have to hit their threes. So NC State's going to work through. They don't turn it over, which is good. Top 10 in the nation in turnover rate. That's huge against Marquette, which is top 20 forcing turnovers. Shaka smart pressure defense. So they don't turn it over. They're going to work through DJ Burns in the post. Marquette's posty is very bad. What's that mean? They're probably going to help a lot, trap, uh, double. Well, for Burns, he's going to get his buckets, but with so much help, he's an elite passer, elite vision. He's going to find the NC State shooters. Can they knock down threes against the defense that allows three-point attempts at top 20 rate? There's a path there for NC State to keep up. They just have to hit their threes because I don't see them getting many stops. So lean the over here. Uh, um and uh, this is just going to come down to me. It's NC State shooting. Marquette, I think, ultimately prevails because they're just going to be able to get easier buckets more consistently. Um, but if Burns is finding shooters because they're not turning it over and the shooters are hitting, NC State can hang around here. Randall, I'll throw it to you. What are you saying? Biggest edge we have at FTN, 7.2% edge, 60% probability of winning on Marquette, minus six points. Everyone is riding with NC State right now. I expect the tickets to come in heavy on them. I agree with you. It was the rebounding. That's how you're going to get Marquette. NC State's not going to do that. Really, the issue with Marquette, I think they would have blown out Colorado if not for Cam Jones getting in foul trouble. He, he went out with his fourth foul, only second time in the last month and a half that's happened. Their offense stalled. They they did struggle, but their defense has improved because they had to play without Kolick, the Big East tournament, and really showed me something against UConn. Uh, they will be able to guard the perimeter, I think, against NC State. Remember, NC State, for most of this year, could not make an outside shot consistently. They struggled against early in the season at games and home against Duke. But then they got scalding hot. Give me some regression with that as well. Burns has been amazing. Absolutely fantastic. Iguodaro, though, athletic guy, should be able to, to limit him a little bit. And even if they double, I trust Shaka in this spot as well more than Kevin Keats. So I'm laying the points, even though it's a lot, and Library's grabbing it. I think Marquette here should win comfortably and move on to the Elite Eight. Kyle Reese, we said. I tried to talk myself in NC State here. I was looking back through some of the data 11 seeds versus two seeds in the NCAA tournament. This is the 20th such meeting. They're three and 16 straight up in those spots. But it's worth noting the 11s have been feisty lately since 2017. They're two and three straight up with two outright wins, and then three and two against the spread when facing those two seeds. And NC State has the offense, certainly, you know, since March 1st, they're top 20 nationally. But as Stuck and, you know, Mike have been pointing out here, the defense still has major holes. And Kolek makes this offense sing in just a totally different way. He looked rejuvenated against Colorado, 21, 11, and 5. Turnovers remain a concern with him. He already has nine during this run in March Madness, but NC State isn't particularly disruptive in that regard. They're 126 in turnover rate in the country. And I think that's the element. That's the one part where maybe they could swing it. A couple extra possessions could lead to a couple extra three-point looks, and maybe they hang around late, but I don't I don't see it in terms of this, you know, this head to head. So I'm just gonna go ahead with Marquette, lay the points, and probably more so than anything, use it as a sweetener onto some parlays, take the golden eagle money line. Yeah, it, and look, Kolik is so important, obviously, one of the most important players to his team in the country. Keep in mind, he missed 
six games and you know they barely beat Xavier they beat Villanova in overtime and then they lost three other games uh by 7 14 and 16 so and Igadora, Igadora missed one of those games so you could argue that you know from a metrics and analytics standpoint that Marquette maybe is a little undervalued um in the market because they kind of underperformed as you would expect without Kolick. Uh, but yeah, this game should be played at a faster pace. So I think that there should be points and these teams start out slow. I'll be looking to bet a live over, you know, sometimes you get some like jitters and, and, you know, maybe the rim is tight. I like to see how it plays out early. And then if you get like a, a some bad shooting early and, I think with the matchups both offenses have, there should be some points in this one. So I'll, I'll be looking for a live over. But uh, unless NC State goes bananas from three, uh, it's hard for me to see them winning this game. So I just don't think that they'll get stops. They can Marquette could just put Burns in conflict all day long, and you need they can't take him out. You know he'll get his rest, but especially if Marquette's pushing it too. Uh, they need Burns on the offensive end. So yeah, uh, I like Marquette as well. All right, let's move on to the second game on Friday. This will tip half hour later, 7.39 Eastern on TBS between Gonzaga and Purdue. Purdue is a five-and-a-half point favorite here, total 154-and-a-half. This game will be played in Detroit, Michigan, a rematch from a game played earlier this season. In that game, Gonzaga actually led by five at the half, ended up losing by 10 because they shot six of 32 from three, 19%, including 0 of 14 from three in the second half. But Purdue was four of 17. So it's not like they shot the lights out either. And if you're looking for a regression under, this would be it. I mean, since February 1st, Gonzaga shot 41% from three. That's top five in the nation. You know, it's higher Purdue at 42%. So between two post-centric offenses, these are two of the top four most post-heavy offenses in the country. Purdue obviously works through Zach Eady. Gonzaga works through Graham Ike. But both defenses are also an elite at defending at the rim. So this could come down to who's making more jumpers, both in the mid-range and from three. And if that's the case, both of these teams may be a little overdue to cool off, which would be your case for the under. Um, now I will say there's a path to offense here for Gonzaga, which has been much better of late. Got to give credit to Ben Gregg. He's been a revelation. They can kind of move Zach Eady around, produce pick and roll defense. It's a bit weak, grades out slightly below national average per synergy. Mark Few will have a good offensive game plan. Look no further than his record, his over record in his tournament career after the first round, 28 and 14 to the over. So, in the half court, Purdue's not going to, you know, turn you over. Pick and roll, move Edie around, hit your mid-range jumpers, which they certainly can do, and stay hot from three. Gonzaga can stay in this game. Now, the caveat is because Purdue, Purdue with their defense, are generally going to force you to work in the mid-range. 358th in mid-range attempt rate allowed. Gonzaga, by the way, 41st in mid-range attempt rate, 7th in mid-range percentage made so they're very good there you can say the same for purdue like this is going to be a jump shooting battle unless the whistle comes into play can gonzaga stay out of foul trouble that is such a big factor in this game because they have no depth bottom five in bench minutes now they do a good job of not fouling both these teams are top 20 in foul rate on the defensive end but purdue top 10 in drawing fouls gonzaga not so Gonzaga is much more likely to get in foul trouble, and they are. They, it would be much more of a detriment to them if they got in foul trouble than Purdue. Obviously, if Edie gets in foul trouble, but he does a good job of defending without fouling. And even though Gonzaga does a good job of defending without, it's Zach Edie. It's going to he draws fouls no matter what, and it's going to depend on how the refs are calling this. I will say, if Edie, if Graham Ike gets in foul trouble, I'm going to look to bet a live over. So I think then Gonzaga can go, you know, with a little more mobile five. They can move Edie around a little easier. And I think that they can have some success offensively still, maybe even more so. And then on the other end, you don't have Ike. 
to battle Edie on the defensive end. He's good as a good post defender. Should be an Edie dunk fest uh, on the other end. So I'll look to live betting over there. So much of this is going to come down to the whistle. So much of this is going to come down to which team can stay hot from the perimeter and who's hitting their mid-range jumpers, which there should be plenty of in this game. Randall, I'll throw it to you first. What are you seeing in Purdue Gonzaga? You know, I think Matt Painter gets too much criticism here. He's had incredible sustained success. And if not for Diakite's incredible play there, he would have been in a final four and could have won a national title. Uh, but I think he's built this team as he had to build it. But that's why also they're vulnerable. Guys, you have the two-time national player of the year, seven foot four inside. You're going to build him with shooters. Now, we tried to bring in Lance Jones from Southern Illinois to have a player who can attack on the wing. And Lance Jones can be okay up and down, but three straight games – uh, nine points or fewer. So I think Gonzaga is very live in this game. EK, Anton Watson inside had some success. They both had four fouls in the first matchup. I, I do think Gonzaga can limit Purdue from beyond the arc easier than Purdue can limit Gonzaga. I expect Gonzaga to make more shots from three. If they don't, they're done. But I do like Nemhart. Ben Gregg's been fantastic. Even Nolan Hickman, who I always bash, has done a very nice job and has been hot from three-point range. I think they keep this game close. I am grabbing the points, no problem. And I think Purdue's on upset alert, not because Matt Painter can't win in March, not because Purdue's underachieving, simply because that this is a team that is built on Edie dominating inside and hitting an excessive amount of threes. And Edie is going to get his, but can EK and Anton Watson control the boards a little bit? Can they limit him better than Utah State did, who got four fouls? on two of their players within the first five minutes, that game was over. That happens. Gonzaga's in trouble. If it doesn't, I think Mark Few hangs around. This team could steal it as well. So I will take the Zags plus five and a half. They have the familiarity. They have the coaching. They're shooting well from three-point range. And E.K. Watson inside, I think, can at least do something to maybe slow down Zach Eady to a, a little bit, which they couldn't do before. Yeah, I will say, yeah, Gonzaga's going to have to have shots. Um, but they're very good in the mid-range, which you can get against Purdue. Because Purdue's very good at limiting transition uh, offenses, which, you know, Gonzaga is awesome in transition, might not get much of that here. And Purdue's great on the defensive glass, and they don't foul. So like Gonzaga, they're not hitting their shots. They're not going to get many second-chance opportunities. They're not really going to get to the line. Uh, but all they've been doing of late is hitting their shots. Cal, Reese, what are you saying? I just want to shout out Mark Few because I think, you know, for the last, let's call it 10 years, the fact that they haven't won a national title, the narrative and the public perception a little bit is that vis-a-vis -vis where they're ranked and, you know, that number next to their name in the AP poll that they've underperformed. This was clearly, I think, one of his best coaching jobs of his entire career. They went from a team that was viewed as being on the bubble about two months ago to being a five seed, to making it to the second weekend, to being viewed as a live dog in the Sweet 16 against a team that spent you know, a portion of the season as the number one team in the country. So kudos to him. I still have the same concerns I did two months ago about this, you know, the Zags team, which is I don't trust Nolan Hickman, mainly because they played against ranked teams six times on the season. He was four points lower than his season average, average in just over 10 points per game. He shot 40% from the field and only 29% from three. And I think that is where this game comes down to. I think both interior big men are going to put up numbers pretty close to their season average and it's which team can share the basketball and knock down their shots produce second nationally in assist to made basket ratio they went from last year being a huge liability in their backcourt to now it being a strength and i'm hoping and this is really where it's a little bit of magical thinking that an extra four to five days of rest for Braden smith is going to make the difference because he still looks like himself as a facilitator in the first two rounds but not as a scorer and that's coming off the injury in the Big Ten tournament. I'm hoping that he can come back, score 10 to 15 points, knock down some threes while also running the offense. Because if he does that, I think Purdue is going to be able to win this game. Although I think the number is just about right. So I'm going to pass on it from a spread perspective. The last stat I like to throw out of teams remaining in the field. You know, we got the 16 squads here. The fewest kill shots surrendered, Purdue. So I think it's difficult to run them off the floor. It's difficult to build on your own momentum and, you know, to put together those long scoring runs. So for that reason, I think they're one of the most consistent teams remaining. So I'll go with Painter squad here. All right, let's move on to the late slate on Friday night. And we will start with Duke taking on Houston. By the way, before we get to this game, just uh, in the episode description, we will have our link to our Discord. I'll be hanging out there for the first half of the games on Thursday night. Got a really good community there. Uh, Nick Giffen and Sean Kern are always giving out winners in props. Uh, so talk shop, talk some ball, sweat uh, the game. So make sure 
if you have the chance to sign up and join us there. But let's move on to Duke Houston in the a one versus four matchup. Houston's a four and a half point favorite here, total 134. It's going to be played in Dallas, Texas. Houston, a little bit of a you know, home state advantage. Uh, when I look at this game, this game tip 939 on CBS, if I didn't say that. Um, when I look at this game, it really comes down to me, can Duke handle Houston's physicality? I've said all year, I think Duke is soft. And that's really what cost them against North Carolina. I think that was like the difference watching those games. North Carolina, very physical team, one of the oldest teams in the country. And at times it looked like men versus boys. And that's what happened to Duke last year. Keep in mind, getting kind of similar vibes. Last year, everyone's favorite Cinderella, Oral Roberts. Everyone was picking them to upset Duke. Duke destroyed them. This year. Oh, and then guess what? Duke next game ran into Tennessee, who just out physical them from this from the jump. Duke barely got to 50 points. This year, everyone's favorite Cinderella, underdog, darling, James Madison. Duke demolishes the Dukes. Now, everyone's back on the Duke bandwagon, but now they're going up against the pinnacle of physical teams in Houston. Can Duke handle? the physicality of Houston. It's going to blow up their pick and roll game. If they can, and they're not turning the ball over, you know, you have to do a couple things against Houston. You can't turn the ball over. You have to handle the physicality. You got to get to the line, make your free throws. You got to get offensive rebounds. Duke's not nationally elite in offensive rebounds are getting in the line, but they're good enough. And then you got to hit your threes. You got to hit, you got to move the ball and hit your threes against that aggressive swarming defense. Duke certainly has the shooting and they can make contested jumpers. If you look, catch and shoot, uh, jumpers per, per synergy, both these teams are like 98th and 99th percentile. Duke on offense, Houston on defense. Something has to give. If Duke goes 14 to 28 from three, like they did against Jimmy, yes, they're going to win. But no one does that against Houston. Six straight years, Calvin Sampson's club has held opponents to 30% or less from three. All that length, they're so well schooled. They always close out well. So even though they give up a ton of attempts, it's very, very difficult to make long twos and threes against them. The data doesn't lie for six, seven years. But can Duke hit those jump shots, and can they handle the physicality? You'll notice that, I think, early, especially on the defensive end. Are they able to battle on the glass against Houston, who makes its living? You know, Duke will make you work. Very good perimeter defense. They're good in pick, against pick and roll, which is important against Houston. They make you work until you know late in the shot clock, although Houston, their offense grows out very well late in the shot clock. They have tough shot makers. Shed always tends to make the right decision. They never turn the ball over. But they do most of the work on the offensive glass. So can Duke deal with the physicality, get those 50-50 balls? If they can, you know, they have paths to offense here. This is a game I want to bet live because even though Houston games are lower scoring, and, you know, while Duke hasn't done well with physical teams, they have really struggled with teams that get out in transition and cook them there. That's not going to be the case here. Duke very comfortable in the half court, so they do have that going for them. Duke plays slow. Houston plays really slow. I, I like the under here. And Duke 13 and three to the under in their past 16 games, they've turned into an under team. And I'll look to live bet it. If Duke's just off shooting early, but it looks like they can handle the physicality, I'll look to bet Duke live. And if Duke's hot from three, I'll look to bet Houston live. Um, because I love live betting Houston games, even though they're lower scoring. Houston's offense is going to go through droughts, they take tough shots. And their defense is going to go through extended stretches where you can't score on them. So it lends to these pretty big swings, which I'll see here. And it's just going to come down to Duke's three-point shooting. Are they making those shots in this game? And I think they'll have some ebbs and flows. Um, but a lot of it will come down to whether they can handle the physicality. And along the same lines, it's the whistle. Houston really lacks depth now. Saw that against Texas A&M. Can they impose their will without getting called for every little ticky-tack foul? Should mention Juwan Roberts dealing with a lot of nagging injuries it can will he be 100 percent throughout he's obviously important in this game but i think ultimately it just comes down to duke dealing with the physicality which they've struggled with now for two seasons i think that'll ultimately might be the difference i'll trust the experience of shed and company and that defense in dallas to get through but i'm pretty close to market uh cal Reese, i'll go to you what do you see 
Yeah, the way you broke it down, I think the key is the preferred pace for Duke. They are fifth nationally in terms of playing games considerably slower than their average tempo. And that is very important to me because I think that lends to the exact kind of game script we're going to have. They have the formula, very low turnover rate. As you mentioned, good, but not elite defensive rebounding. They're 50th in defensive rebounding percentage. They have multiple knockdown shooters. Whistles and officiating goes without saying it's going to be key in this game because Houston just doesn't have the depth. I, I think I'm going to go with a prop here. Um, I'm going to go with this game to be decided by less than five points in either direction. I can look it up uh, while Randall's giving his take on this, what the the latest number is. But I just have this feeling that it's going to come down to the final 90 seconds. Um, and for that reason, you know, I, I think that Duke in general, in terms of playing against more physical teams, if this was a physical team that was playing faster, I think them beating them up and leading to more possessions could be a bigger advantage for Houston. But the fact is, I think this will be a low possession game, a grinding out half court game. I think that plays towards the Blue Devils. So I'll look up this uh, these odds here. Randall, while he's doing that, what are you saying here? Yeah, you had it uh, stuck. I think Blue Devils are soft. I do. I, I think they're going to – they're overinflated because of what happened in those first two games. And I think the market is overcorrecting with Houston because of that rough matchup with Texas a which we knew was going to be tough. Uh, everyone got in foul trouble and they escaped. But the two th- two of the bets that I love right away, and I'm curious what uh, Nick Giffen and, and Sean Kerner are going to think, I'm going Jared McCain under 13 and a half points. And I'm also going under two and a half made threes, which at, at BetMGM is juiced heavily to the under. You nailed it with the Cougars perimeter defense. They are not going to let Duke go nuts from three. That game against James Madison was the perfect live betting situation. Once they got hot early and Terrence Williams had two fouls, that game was over. There was no path. Houston's physicality, it mirrors Tennessee last year, knows a Kai Ziegler. They were still able to push them around. Uh, Filipowski's had games where he scored 20, 25 points, but they lose those games because they need perimeter scoring. I'm not sold on Jeremy Roach. who was hurt a little bit in that last game as well. Houston advances. I'm laying the points. I don't trust Duke here. They have not seen the type of pressure and defensive intensity really the whole season that they're going to see here. And the only time they ran up against tough teams who are de- uh, defensive minded in the ACC, who have good defensive metrics like North Carolina, they lost, including the last game of the regular season at home with the ACC title on the line. You're not going to get more of an effort spot than that. I think Houston wins and covers here. Yeah. Obviously Edwards, who's now on the transfer portal, getting his early foul trouble for James Madison hurt and uh, Duke shooting 14 to 28 from three. That's going to happen. They obviously have a ton of talent, but they're definitely going to be at a disadvantage in the physicality department. Anything you wanted to add Calvers? If you take either team to win by five or fewer, it's plus 165, plus 170 in the market, which means that assuredly this game's going to go to overtime and a team's going to win by eight because that's how my entire tournament has gone. Just bets going to die in the extra period. Same. All right, let's move on to the final game of the Sweet 16. Friday, 10.09 Eastern, TBS in Detroit. Creighton taking on Tennessee. Tennessee is a... Two and a half point favorite here, total sitting at 144 and a half. These teams, 18 tournament appearances since the tournament expansion. Neither has made the final four. So both looking for their first final four appearance. We'll have to win two games this weekend to get there. This is similar to the Houston Duke game for me. Can Creighton handle the physicality of Tennessee? That ultimately might be the difference, especially the ball pressure. On the outside, what's Stephen Ashworth going to do? Tennessee has can pressure the ball. Creighton, look, they're they're high variance teams. They shoot a ton of threes. Shoot them top ten rate, make them at a top thirty clip. They're going to get up a ton of threes. But Tennessee defends the three as well as any team in the country. They can test everything. Ninety ninth percentile guarded jump shot rate for synergy. Both these teams take away the three. Elite at defending at the rim. You got to work in the mid range. Creighton hates doing it. They never work in the mid-range, although they're like top two in mid-range percentage. Trey Alexander's great there. Tennessee's defense, much better at defending their mid-range, and they have Dalton Connect. Uh, he's not. I don't think he's going to have a, another bad game. Tennessee survived the 3 of 25 shooting game from three. Meanwhile, Creighton shot 46% from three, and their opponents 26% in the first two games, and they sh- arguably shouldn't be here. So I think Tennessee is going to get more shots more possessions because they're going to force more turnovers. Creighton never forces turnovers. And they're going to get more offensive rebounds. Creighton's good on the defensive glass, but 
Tennessee will still get their boards, and Creighton doesn't go after offensive rebounds. So I think Connect is going to be the difference maker. Foul trouble will be important to watch, now the big's battling down low. But And I know Barnes has been horrific in the tournament. I think 1-14 and 14 against the spread since 2010 is a favorite of under 10 or an underdog, which is definitely troubling. But I'm going to trust Connect, the pressure defense, the pressure and perimeter defense of Tennessee, and the fact that they have the bodies to throw a caulk brenner. And just that physicality, I think, again, you just have to hope Creighton doesn't go nuclear from three. But I like the balls here. Randall, I'll throw it to you. Yeah, look, guys, this scares the hell out of me because I've been fading Creighton all year, but they have those great Ken Palm metrics on offense, defense, efficiency, and they're just lurking. They're hanging around. They should have lost to Oregon, but you got Dante coming back to the ball, shoots the free throw instead of a more secure free throw shooter. But they're right here. However, Stuck, I think Connect, they have no answer for. He should have a monster game here. Dylan Mitchell really locked him up and caused a lot of problems. Creighton doesn't have that player. Now, I do think what I've seen, and I saw this in the Big East tournament with Creighton, Trey Alexander is doing a much better job of attacking the paint, getting to the basket, and sort of collapsing defenses a little bit. So if he has a monster game, Creighton is going to make this really, really uncomfortable for me. But I am on Tennessee. Zakai Ziegler here wasn't here last year against Florida Atlantic. And they were dominating that game against Florida Atlantic, and then they just gave up a bevy of threes. They cannot let that happen against Creighton. Uh, Shireman is, uh, Kalkbrenner inside has hurt me twice with the over on his points props. I don't think that's going to happen again, assuming that we have reasonable foul trouble. Huge game from Dalton Connect. I got the over on his prop as well. And I do think Tennessee wins. Just don't give me one of these 11 of 15 from three point games with Creighton because it's not going to continue the whole tournament. They're going to have a bad game. I just hope it's here against Tennessee. Calabrese, is this your time to slander Rick Barnes? Oh, most definitely. Um, but I'll start with this. Yes, Creighton is lucky to be here. You know, they shouldn't have beat Oregon. But this team still has a top gear against really elite competition. They beat UConn by 19. They beat Mar- Marquette by 14. They beat Alabama in a shootout as well. They're a little too three-point dependent for me to go with them, you know. To... They can beat anyone when they're going off from three. But Ex- that, Exactly. They, they fire up nearly 30 per game. In terms of, like, buying a future on them, it makes me less interested because they have to string together that many games where the threes are dropping. But in a single game here, listen, let, let's talk about Tennessee. I'll put Rick Barnes aside. We all know that I think Rick Barnes is a big-time liability in March. Four and 16 against the spread in his last 20 tournament games. It's not a blip. It's been 15 years of this. But... Let's just look at the players on the floor here in the year of our Lord, 2024. Tennessee, in their last four games, they lost to Kentucky at home despite a 40-point game from Connect. So he showed up, and it still didn't matter. They looked disinterested in a blowout loss to Mississippi State, where if they win the SEC tournament in Nashville, they're probably a one seed instead of a two seed. And then they nearly blow a double-digit halftime lead to Texas and win by four. I understand they shot you know three for a million from three-point range. But that is not the kind of positive momentum you want to come into the second weekend, particularly with a coach that's trying to get a monkey off his back that has struggled and hasn't won a game in the second weekend in, what, 2007, 2008? So I think I'm going to go with Creighton here. I think it it doesn't feel tremendous given the fact that they should have lost that Oregon game. But when I look at Tennessee, it's not just the numbers on Barnes. It's the play recently and offensively in the last month, they've slid all the way back to 145th nationally in Torvik on the offensive adjusted efficiency metrics. So I think there's some warts on this team. I think they were playing their better basketball two months ago. We talked about this a lot, Stuck. There's teams like Wazoo was playing better two months ago. Like It's just a shame that they couldn't head into the tournament at the end of January. I kind of feel that way with Tennessee. I think they were a legit national title contender. They could have beaten anybody. They're just not playing their best basketball right now. So I'm going to go with the Blue Jays money line. All right, Red, I know you got to run one word before you go. Favorite first round bet? I mean, favorite Sweet 16 bet? One deep. Uh, Yep. Let's see. Favorite Sweet 16 bet. I'm going with my Clemson Tigers to cover no problem and win outright against Arizona. There you go. I'm going scary. I'm going San Diego State. Keep it within single digits. Uh, Losing about 10 is fine, too. Calabrese? Uh, Just real quick to give an extra boost to Randall. Clemson, the number one team remaining in the tournament, according to Evan. And Mia in terms of playing up against quality opponents. So I think that that's a good look there. I think the easiest money on the board is North Carolina over 89, 90 on their team total. Alabama can't play any defense. I think it's going to be a track meet. I think they get to triple digits. All right. That'll do it for us. And this week, 
316 betting people, make sure you check us out. BBOC Live, 1030 a.m. Eastern tomorrow. We'll also be back for the Elite Eight, Saturday, 1030 a.m. Eastern. And then we will have our Final Four preview next week on this channel. But thanks for tuning in. Good luck on all of your waiters. Thanks to Mike and Mike for joining me. Thanks to our producers in the back end. Most importantly, thanks to all of you for tuning in. Make sure you subscribe, unsubscribe, subscribe to our friend, Town Enemy. Leave a review, five-star review. They really help us out. I'll do giveaways next week. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you for the... BBOC live shows this weekend and for the final four episode next week. Cheers.